We're in 2 Timothy tonight. 2 Timothy. Or in the words of our president, 2 Timothy. <laughs> Chapter 1. We'll be in Timothy for about probably six or seven weeks, uh, the second Timothy. And uh, look forward to getting into it and learning some important practical exhortations and truth. This is a letter that Paul wrote. It's one of the prison epistles. And so it's a, an epistle that would have been written in a very difficult period of Paul's life. And I say difficult not because uh, of Paul's struggle, but I'm just talking about because he was going through a lot physically. I don't mean he was down or that he, it was a low point in his life. It certainly wasn't. But for Paul, it was written at a time when he would have been under attack by up-and-coming, uh, ambitious Christians uh, particularly if you think about his letter to the church at Philippi, who preached Christ out of envy and strife to promote, for self-promotion. And they preached against Paul instead of preaching for Jesus. And uh, it was a unique time in his ministry. Paul's writing to a young man that was refreshing and faithful, and he has a series of commands and exhortations to Timothy, his son in the faith. We'll begin reading in verse 1, go down to verse 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And here we'll stop and we will look at one of the first uh, areas this evening of application in this portion of Scripture. Uh, before we look at Paul and his attitude with Timothy, I want to just point out something that is thematic in most of the epistles that were written by the Apostle Paul. In each of those, he, he alludes to or he references his call. The fact that he was called in verse 1 by the will of God. Now, it is an area for many individuals of great confusion of the matter of being called to something specific. Now, we know what was Paul called to specifically. What was one of the things he was called to? Suffer. Hey, yes, he was called to suffer. Yes, you know, uh, he mentioned in Corinthians that we are made a laughing stock. Or, no, I'm sorry, not, uh, yeah, it was, in, it was to the church at Corinthians. He said, we are... Uh, called to be a laughing stock, while you actually aren't going to suffer the same kind of persecution. You're, you're called to honor. We're called uh, to dishonor as an apostle, as, as an example of individuals that it looks as though there's nothing in, in following Jesus that's good for them. They're foolish to follow Christ, and that's what they've been called to, in contrast with the, uh, with the believers at Corinth that Paul alluded to. So called to suffer, what else? It was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Do you remember when uh, when Paul had first gotten saved, and they were terrified of him in their early church, and and so uh, was it Cornelius? What? Who was the man? Not Cornelius. Who was the man that was sent to Paul to lead him uh, to to go and to get him? Who was it? Ananias. Oh yeah, Ananias. Okay, I always mess up. I mess up Cornelius, Ananias, several of those names. Uh, anyway, so Ananias was sent to go get the apostle Paul. And here he is blind, 
And Ananias is scared to death of him. And God told Ananias, don't be afraid of him. He is going to be, uh, he's going to preach to kings and to the Gentiles and in palaces. He's going to preach in these places. So he's called specifically to that. In Romans, Paul talked about when he defended himself to his Jewish brethren in the faith, he mentioned specifically his call to be an apostle, but he also mentioned as well the fact that that would have been an averse thing to him uh, as being a Jew. But he was specifically called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And in that statement is couched the real answer to what Paul was, Paul, Paul was called to. Paul was called to, which is to be an apostle. He's called to be an apostle. And in every one of his letters, he mentions Paul, an apostle, or called to be an apostle, separated by the will of God. Who is it that called Paul to be an apostle? The one who met him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? God called him. God called him. And there were many individuals, uh, there were many individuals that were uh, preaching the gospel out of envy and strife against Paul, and they weren't called by God. And there are many individuals that someday are going to fit in that description. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils? And Jesus is going to say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Uh, my friend, it's important to be genuinely born again, to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not preaching complicated salvation this evening. I'm not saying you have to be called to be saved. Uh, my friend, everyone's called to be saved. God will have all men to be saved, as Brother uh, Andrew quoted this evening. Everyone's called to be saved. But friend, he's talking about what you've done. I've preached. I've accomplished. I've done this and done it perfectly does not mean you'll be on your way to heaven. I read uh, last year, I read a Barna Research poll that polled individuals who are gospel preachers. I mean guys that would have been in independent Baptist church pulpits. And there was a secret poll, and one of the questions that, that they asked them is, do you really believe what you preach? Do you really believe what you preach? And these are guys that vehemently declared the gospel of Jesus Christ, preached the word of God. Some of them confessed that they were closet atheists. Matter of fact, 25%. 25% of those polled. Literally, they stand in pulpits around the world and proclaim what the Word of God teaches is the Gospel, and they themselves have not received it. I cannot but help but think that in the ranks of those individuals who are preachers of the Gospel, that if they're not saved, they're also not called. But being saved is not the, is not the same thing as being called to be an apostle. Or if you look down in verse 11, being called to be a preacher. Look at, uh, he's, look at verse 11. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, he's speaking of the gospel, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, where was Paul appointed? Well, when he was born again, Ananias was sent to get him. He was brought to the apostles, and they recognized the gift that God had given them, but they laid hands on him, and they ordained him into the gospel ministry, and Paul was called by God to be an apostle and recognized by the other apostles as such. It would have been impossible for Paul to pull off pretending to be an apostle. There are many individuals today that call themselves apostles. Help me with this. When I face someone, stand face to face with someone, they tell me they're an apostle, what would you recommend I say? <laughs> Give me something nice. <laughs> I doubt it is uh, the nicest thing I've come up with. I'm an apostle, but I doubt it. Whenever somebody tells me they're an apostle or a brother, I say, I doubt it because the Bible says you're not, and I don't believe in extra biblical revelation. Uh, so, I, I honestly, to some degree, um, false doctrine needs to be rebuked and confronted, but to some degree, it's a waste of time as well. And so, you know, individuals that want to be called to be an apostle are not concerned about whether or not they actually are. They're also not concerned about the authority of the Scripture. In other things, they want to be the authority instead of the Scripture. So, words that I could share with them won't do much. Normally, I do it for the sake of whoever follows them. If someone is with them and thinks they're an apostle, I'll challenge them, not for their sake, but for the sake of the person following them. As they're 
they're not concerned with truth. They're concerned with the following. But maybe the person following them might be in, interested to know the truth. And so Paul here talks about being called, being called to be a preacher, called to be a gospel preacher. You say, Pastor, we don't have apostles today. No, but we have pastors and we have individuals that are supposed to have hands laid on them in order to be called. Look at verse 6. Timothy was one of those individuals. Uh, Paul told Timothy, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Timothy was called. He was called. He was a representative. He wasn't an apostle, but he represented the apostles. I think oftentimes, uh, particularly because we're in our 1 Corinthians series on Wednesdays right now, I think of Apollos. Was Apollos an apostle? No, but Apollos was certainly a teacher, wasn't he? And do you think that he had a gift? Well, he absolutely had a gift. And there, it was a gift, I believe, that was a supernatural gift that it was put in him by the laying on of hands. My friend, the ability to stand up and run your mouth doesn't make you a preacher. <laughs> Just doesn't. The ability uh, to be disrespectful or to mouth off or to scream and yell doesn't make you a preacher. The call of God does. The calling of God does. Uh, when I was ordained, I was... Uh, had seen other ordinations before this, and I knew this question would be asked of me, and I thought it, I thought about it ahead of time. And they asked a question almost at every ordination I've ever been at. The question is, if we decide today not to ordain you, what are you going to do? And what they want you to say is, well, bless God, you know, I've been called by God, I'm not called by you, and if you don't acknowledge me, then I'm going to preach the gospel anyway, because I'm a gospel preacher, and you know, rah, rah, rah. If individuals that God's called to preach and that are supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit have come to lay hands on you to acknowledge that you've been called, and they don't think you've been called, there might be a problem. It's not either a problem with them, which means there's a problem with you. You ask guys to ordain you that aren't legitimate, well, that's a problem with you, actually. Who have you aligned yourself with? Who have you put yourself under? And if they see a problem with you, then there's a problem because individuals who you believe are called don't, don't believe that you are. So I remember when I was asked that, I said, well, be honest with you guys. If you men don't think I'm called to the ministry, I've got a lot to think about. I've got a lot to pray about because I think God called me. But if you are representatives of Him and you're supposed to lay hands on me, and you think there's a reason not to, then I need to hear the reason. That's my answer. They didn't have a reason not to ordain me, by the way. <laughs> they ordained me. And I think that probably they wouldn't have convened an ordination council if they didn't have full intention of ordaining me to begin with. But it's a serious matter. It's a serious matter. Lay hands on no man suddenly. Which it ought to be something that's pondered, that's examined and searched out. It's a serious issue. God give us, God give us preachers who are called. Not by man, not by a desire, not by pretext or pretense, but are called by God. We don't have many. I can't help but think that God wants to call more than what we have. But we need preachers that are called. Churches are full of individuals that know how to grow an organization. They're not called. They don't have God's power. Paul understood, not only was he called, but he also wanted Timothy to remember that he was called. That's the second thing I want to mention about that. You can have God's calling in your life and not stir it up. How do you stir up a gift? How do you stir up a gift? You understand that vernacular there. Don't neglect to stir up the gift that's in you by the putting on of hands. How do you stir up the gift? Well, what does the gift symbolize, first of all? When the hands were laid on somebody, when Paul laid his hands on Timothy and transferred to him, what did transfer to him? 
<laughs> what did trans what, what what was the laying on the hands? What did it signify? The Holy Spirit being put upon him. Yeah, the Spirit of God right. preached the gospel. How do you stir up the Spirit? I think it first begins by what you don't do. You don't quench the Spirit and you don't grieve the Spirit. And I'll tell you something, I listen. I listen to what people call preaching and it's grievous to God's Holy Spirit. A lot of self-exaltation, a lot of arrogance, a lot of pride. There's not a lot of God's Spirit. Sometimes I think the louder you get, the more you're covering up a lack of power. Sometimes I think the more vociferous and the trashier or the lower an individual stoops in their vernacular, the more it's covering up a lack of power. The lack of a gift not being stirred up in them. Paul said, don't neglect to stir up the gift in you. You stir up the gift, first of all, by not quenching the Spirit of God. Man, God's Spirit needs to be in an environment of holiness. Reverence. And God's Spirit needs to not be quenched. But you know, just having God's Spirit in you doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the gift stirred up. Not quenching the Spirit's a good start. But you know, a person needs to be filled with the Spirit. And I believe that's what Paul is urging Timothy to do. How's a man get filled with the Spirit? You get in the Word of God, you crucify the flesh. You can't be spirit filled with the Spirit when you're in the flesh and when you're feeding the flesh. You've got to crucify the flesh. Feed the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Obey the Spirit of God. That gift will get stirred up. Get in the Word of God. Spend time with God. Commune with the Spirit. Let God's Spirit talk to you. Remember that song, Let Us Have a Little Talk with Jesus? You ever think about the words of that carefully? I don't want to offend anybody. I offended so many people over talking about that other song. Uh, which one is it that everybody likes? The one. Uh, you want to hate? Yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Everybody got offended about that. I'm going to offend you guys again if you like gospel music. Let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let's tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our prayer and pain and cry, and he'll answer by and by. He'll hear the little prayer wheels turning and a little fires burning. fires burning. A little talk with Jesus makes it right. That isn't being, that isn't communing with the Spirit. God, let me tell you all about me. We need to hear all about God. There's too much of us and too little of Him. If you were to write a paragraph, God is like, start with the words, God is like. It reminds me of a guy I was talking to, is charismatic when I was in college, and he told me, God is like an elephant. He's so big. We're like blind men. We're all just around the elephant, and every one of us has got a hold of him. And one of them, one of us has a tusk, and one of us, you know, has a trunk, and one of us has a toe, and one of us has got a tail. And we're all blind, and we all describe who God is, and it's who He is to us. And it's all God. But it's a different perspective for each of us. I sat there like this, thinking, well, first of all, I never heard of that one. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's an interesting perspective. In other words, God's different to everybody based on their perspective is what He was illustrating. The problem with the illustration is God's not an elephant. And He's not revealed to us by our feelings. He's revealed to us in His Word. God is like, chapter and verse please. God is like, another chapter and verse please. My friend, it is an endless, inexhaustible study. 
to find out what God is like. But most people blah, blah, blah about what God is like. But it's from hanging on to an elephant. Just reaching out there and grabbing what we feel. It's like what we've told God about ourselves and the way we've related to Him. But there's very little of adjusting ourselves to what we've learned about Him. And we're supposed to stir up the Spirit in us. My friend, you stir up the Spirit by feeding the Spirit of God. Finding out who He is, communing with Him. How well do you know the Christ in you? Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Spirit, the Comforter, which the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. But Jesus said, when He's come, He will teach you all things and guide you into all truth. Jesus said, it's better for you that I'm gone than if you're here because of the ministry of God's Spirit. Do you suppose the disciples knew Jesus pretty well? Do you suppose if you said, John, what's Jesus like? He could write a gospel? I think he could. He wrote a gospel and he said, Jesus is like. He told us what Jesus is like. Who Jesus is. And God's Holy Spirit is Christ in us. I will not leave you comfortless. Another is another of the same kind. Jesus is living in us. Stir Him up. Stir Him up. If you start to stir up the gift that's in you, my friend, the word Jesus will come out. Because that's who the Holy Spirit is representing in us. Jesus. You'll be talking about Jesus. You won't be talking about other Christians. You won't be talking about uh, lost people. You'll be talking about Jesus. That's what people need to hear about Jesus. You'll be telling them Jesus is like, and you'll be giving specifics. Jesus. Paul told Timothy, stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Get in the Word. Get in the Spirit. Fellowship with the Spirit. And then preach as a result of that. I want to talk as well about something that is related, and these are some of the emotions that Paul expresses in his introduction to the letter. Uh, he talks about Timothy's tears. He talks about his lack of shame or his carefulness not to be ashamed. And urges Timothy not to be ashamed. So he talks about feelings and emotions, how to feel. In verse 4, Paul said, I'm greatly desiring to see thee, after he said that I pray for you day and night or night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. It's evident from the text that Timothy, because of the separation of his father in the faith, literally shed tears. He was literally grieved at the separation between himself and Paul because of his fondness for Paul and his desire to be with that apostle who had laid hands on him, who had encouraged him in the faith, who taught him in the faith, and with whom he had served. Timothy had shed tears. Paul said, I pray for you night and day, and I remember your tears when I do. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to get around somebody that cares. If the believers are what they ought to be. Do you think that there was love between Paul and Timothy, the kind of love, the kind of desire and compassion to encourage and to fellowship with one another? What a friendship. What a fellowship. That when Paul and Timothy are at a place of parting, tears are shed. Paul remembers that about Timothy. He said, I remember you crying when I left. And I'm earnestly desirous to see you. I'm mindful of your tears. And he said, I pray for you night and day. Friend, is anything more helpful, more touching than the prayer of a saint on your behalf? Who do you pray for? Who do you pray for? Is there anyone that you pray for night and day? Or do you pray for yourself? Do you think about yourself? Do you think of others? Do you love others? 
So here's an example here in Timothy of the love that brethren ought to have, the concern, the compassion, the care that brethren ought to have for each other. If I could instill a spirit or an attitude in our church that I believe would be pleasing to God, it would be the love of the brethren. Not, I love you, words that are verbalized, but the love of a brother that has one thinking on and praying for one another night and day. Anyone here? Would anyone here be encouraged or helped by someone shedding tears over you and praying for you night and day? Would anyone here not wish for that kind of zeal, that kind of a desire that someone would go before God for you on a continuous basis night and day? Then oughtn't we to bestow the same? We're going to have trouble not loving each other if we actually loved each other. <laughs> I know that sounds like a contradiction. But the reality of it is that sometimes when people come and they gripe about another Christian to me, well, you know, this guy is this or that, whatever. You know what I just think is you just don't love them. If you prayed for them, if you cared about them, you'd be more concerned that your negative perspective on them would hurt them than you are about whatever it is that irritates you. And most of that's all it is. You know, Christians ought to be irritated with each other. We're all different. We have different personalities. You know, if you don't have a sense of humor, people with a sense of humor grade a little bit, don't they? On your nerves. If you have a sense of humor, people with that one bother you just a little bit, don't they? You know what? You ought to love each other. And it shouldn't matter whether you've got a sense of humor or not. Whether you can take a joke or whether you can give one out or whatever. It doesn't matter. Not if you love people. Paul is not here with Timothy saying, we're just alike. And that's why we get along so well. And he's saying, you're my son and my faith. And Timothy loved Paul and he shed tears over him. And then there's another emotion that Paul mentions. And he talks about He talks about shame. Look at verse 7. He said, God hath not given us, after he said, don't neglect the gift which is in thee by putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Paul warns Timothy not to be afraid to preach because of scorn or confusion, or not confusion, but because of mocking or laughter or people trying to intimidate him. You say, Pastor, is he talking about lost people? I think if you read Philippians, you'd see it's the saved people. I think if it's Philippians, it's people that are mouthing off and maligning Paul and saying that the reason he's in prison is not because he's faithful to Lord Jesus Christ, but it's because he's not a bold preacher and he's not this and he's not that. All the things they said about him out because of envy and strife. He's not really an apostle. He's not really called. He's not this and he's not that. I think that's what Paul's talking about here. And he told Timothy, he said, don't you worry about people running their mouths about you. Don't be ashamed. God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He does not say to respond to them. We know what he said in Philippians. He said, whether Christ is preached out of envy and strife, he said, I rejoice Christ is preached. If somebody gets saved and they're obnoxious and they're lying and they're attacking you on a personal... Where in the world does attack of a brethren... Uh, where, where's that taught in the Scripture? Where's attacking other believers in the Scripture? Where's that at in the Bible? Where we're told, you know, this is a way that we know we're His disciples that we attack the brethren. Is that what the Bible says? How do we know that we're His disciples? That we love one another. It's a real sign you're not a disciple when all you do is malign and attack the brethren. And that's what Paul and Timothy are dealing with. And Paul said, uh, Be not there, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me His prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He said, just embrace the affliction. Just take it. Be silent and take it. And then he goes on to say in verse... Or I'm sorry, in verse 11, 
I'm a appointed or I'm a appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. Then notice twelve for the which cause I also suffer these things. Why is it Paul suffering for the ministry? Because he's appointed to be a preacher, he's appointed to be an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. And then he says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I like the song that's written from this. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And Timothy is told, hold fast the form of sound words in which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And Christian, I want to exhort you the same. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, of the truth of Jesus Christ. A couple of times in my life, I have been attacked or maligned by unbelievers. If I were aware all the time of how much it goes on, I could say I'm constantly attacked by believers. Now, I could say a couple times in my life I've been attacked by unbelievers, but I can say that I've almost continually my whole life been attacked by believers for preaching truth. What should I do? <laughs> Preach the truth, hold fast, not be ashamed. If you stand for truth, you'll be scoffed and scorned. And friend, I hate to say it, I hate to break this to you, but you'll probably be attacked more by so-called Christians than by lost people. Boy, I heard it last week, Sunday morning, when I mentioned the origins of rock music. I heard about it. I heard about being mean-spirited, hateful, a lot of things. I'll hear about it some more when it hits the interwebs, I'm sure. Truth's truth. Wikipedia knows the origins of gospel music. It's just Christians who are worldly that don't. <laughs> Isn't it so? I don't hate anybody because of that. I'm not against anybody. I understand where a lot of folks are coming from, but we need to hear some truth. And probably, probably we need to hear it more because it shouldn't be so shocking to hear I think sometimes things are shocking because they're not heard often enough. You ever heard something enough and it's like, yeah, yeah, I heard it. Doesn't shock you anymore? Well, that's the way wickedness seems, but what about truth? Paul said, I'm a gospel preacher and I'm not ashamed. And he's not going to be bullied or maligned or silenced because of people talking about his bonds. Paul's in prison. I mean, if God's blessing was on him, then why is he in jail? Why is Paul in prison? Well, because when Paul was called to be an apostle, he was called to preach in palaces. And that was the direct access way to the palace was to appeal to Caesar. That's why. And Paul knew it. And believers that knew the truth knew it, but didn't stop people talking. Don't worry about that. Just preach the truth. Ask the question, is there a gift in me which is in me by the laying on of hands? Ask that of people that have the gift of the, in them. See if God's called you. I think more are called than are in the ministry that are surrendering to it. But many are in the ministry who aren't called. That's the real problem. Paul identifies it here. Lays it out. That's a real help. We're going to see some exhortations over the next few weeks, just direct commands on how Timothy is to deport himself as pastor and how the church is supposed to behave and form and function. And it'll be a real help to us. Father, we thank you for what we've learned this evening in this introduction, and I pray that you would help us to be able to absorb these truths and these emotions that we see modeled for us by your Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, who is a preacher and also a teacher. We thank you for what we've learned in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Again.